Hello there, welcome back. Another football chat with Ben. It's daily, did you know? One today, one tomorrow, one on Wednesday, one on Thursday, and you've guessed it, one on Friday. Uh, again, we recorded this one on the 29th of July, so anything that happens after the 29th of July, we won't have covered. So if Nigel Pearson's come back in some sort of gladiatorial way, we haven't covered it in this episode. But anyway, uh, I'm joined by two great guests for this one, so listen in, tune in, and enjoy. <laughs> Folks, welcome back to another football chat with Ben. It's our second preview show for the Premier League, and I'm joined by two people. Sadly, we couldn't get a Leicester fan on. Uh, so, if you are a Leicester fan out there and you're interested in coming on in the future, then do let me know in the comment section or tweet me at Dr. Benji for more information. So, then, luckily for me, we do have a Palace fan and an Everton fan. Well, I'll say lucky for me, we've got an Everton fan on as well. Uh, we'll start with the Palace fan. Uh, Jim Daily Comedy is joined with me. He makes silly videos. He's got a lovely Instagram, which I recommend you check out at Jim Daily Comedy, uh, and a YouTube channel, JDS, which is JD's Football Songs. Uh, Jim, how are you doing? Hello, I'm good. You were telling me before that you're underwhelmed by my Instagram. What should I? What should I be doing? I want to see more food. Um, more food. Okay. Yeah, more I don't. Food. I don't have a lot of money. Thus, I don't eat a lot of food. So um, I might struggle with that one. All right. Well, the more, the more dinners, the better. I think that's that, that's, <laughs> I'll the, try. that's the key to Instagram success. I think. I'll try. I'm also vegetarian, so there will be no meat in it. So if, if people are offended by lack of meat, oh then... no, no, a niche audience. I think you put yourself there. I'm looking <laughs> forward to seeing more more food. At, okay, tune in, folks, for more food on Jim's Instagram, uh, and also. Uh, we've got an Everton fan, which isn't great, but I mean we have to have one, yeah. one a season. Totally. Uh, Roger Cannon, how are you doing? You are you're a freelance writer, videographer, columnist for Talk Two Fan Zone, and the head editor of the Toffee Talk. I'm very good. I came just come off the back of watching the highlights of Dundee versus Everton, where Stephen Naismith played up front for about an hour. So, oh, brilliant. No, it's not brilliant. No, is, that, is, that, <laughs> is, that, is that not what you wanted pre-season? I I want a, a, a striker. That can play football, right? Well, well, Stephen Naismith is not a striker. Well, and he, well, he can't really play football at the same time. So we'll talk about what you've already got. I think that's we'll start there. But um, no, we'll go to Crystal Palace first. Obviously, a tenth place finish, Jim, last season. Um, not bad, I would say, considering the start you had. I think not bad is an understatement. It was <laughs> it was incredible, and it's the second season in a row that Palace had a, an underwhelming start and then turned it around. But to turn it around and end up in the top half, I mean. Apparently, Palace were the first team to go from the bottom three to the top ten um, in half a season uh, ever. I think in the Premier League, which, which, which is some record. So I can't really say how good the turnaround was on the part of It was incredible, and it was basically the same set of players. Uh, and like Pulis last season, just just got them believing. You know, just kind of got them into a right system, playing a bit better football, and just. It all kind of flourished, and players like Balassi suddenly looked like world beaters, and Wilf Zaha was was suddenly finding confidence. It was it was wonderful. I mean, we'd have taken survival, um, but to finish tenth is just huge and and massive progress for the club on and off the pitch. Yeah, obviously you start the season with Warnock, which which many Premier League club has done, uh, <laughs> yeah. and and didn't finish the season with Warnock. But obviously, you brought Pardew in. There was a lot written pre Pardew appointment about whether he'd be the right man for the job but he seems to like you you seem to like him and it seems to have worked out for everyone yeah he needs he needs to be that guy that's center of attention that everyone loves he needs to be sort of king of the castle and <laughs> we needed someone to do that you know warnock this time you know it was warnock 2.0 and he wasn't the same as before you know before he was this fiery character this time round, he was just it was almost like he was sort of semi-retired. He just was here for the enjoyment. Every game afterwards, he was saying, well, I'm really enjoying being Palace manager here. And we're like, well, we're not enjoying it. We're losing every week. Can you <laughs> sort it out? So we needed someone with a bit more sort of vigour and a bit more arrogance. And, and, and Pardew, you know, if you're looking for someone with arrogance, then, uh, you know, you can't, you can't do wrong than Alan Pardew. But it's totally worked out. It was the right fit for him, right fit for us. He, you know, Pardew was a was a cult hero at Palace you know don't don't be under any illusion that he was one of our best ever midfielders he wasn't he was probably one of our worst midfielders but <laughs> he scored a very crucial goal as you'll know Ben against Liverpool in the semi-final of the 1990 FA Cup that elevated him to cult hero status and and now he sort of is, is on the crest of that cult hero status and the fact that he's a manager so it, it's all just been the perfect the perfect recipe really the timing was right he was the right person we were the right club and as a result look where we are well, well, as you say, 10th is... I wouldn't like to call it extraordinary, because <laughs> I feel that's almost disrespectful. But I think pre-season, I think that at the start of the year, you're hoping to stay up and then and to come 10th. Is that fair? Oh, totally, totally. And, and, and I mean, it's, it's so difficult to 
to go up and stay up. And, and at Palace, we, we were always that yo-yo club. And I think we had the record for the most relegations and promotions between the Premier League and the First Division and the Championship. So really, for us, it was always about staying up. And, and even going into this season, it's still about staying up. And, and that might sound a bit underwhelming, but we want to build as a club and progress. And you won't do that if you get relegated. So even if we don't come 10th, or ninth, you know, even if we end up twelfth or thirteenth, it's still we still stayed up. We still earn the money, TV money, and the and the and the prize money. So we're still progressing, and we'll still be able to attract people. Um, so yeah, it's. I mean, Palace fans. Some Palace fans are getting a bit carried away. You know, some are saying, "Oh, Europe, Europa League place." So, Pardew even said fifth place. Yesterday. Oh, I love that. I love. I mean, that. But, but he knows what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's playing the media. He's playing the fans. But if we stay up again and finish around mid table, then that's great. Are you can as, as a Palace fan, are you concerned because this happens with a lot of clubs? Are you concerned that by Christmas, if you're sitting in seventeenth and you're you're not looking too hot, you've had a rough start? Are you concerned that people are turning him? Or is, it, is he the sort of character will, that will continue to just bat it off until it's too obvious and he has to go? Or is it a situation where enough Palace fans realise the situation you're in and even if you don't have a great start to the season, things will just carry on in the second half and expect to pick up like they, like they did this season? I think he'll certainly get more backing and more time than previous managers, uh, than, than Neil Warnock, for example. Um, and he has this weird record of going... He doesn't really draw many games. He sort of goes on long winning runs and long defeat runs, which we sort of saw at the end of last season with Palace. I think we won seven, six on the bounce, and then we lost three or four, and we, we, we didn't really sort of draw many games. And then, thankfully, we picked it up at the end of the season with a couple of wins. But So I wouldn't, you know, I don't think that will happen. But if it does, yes, yes, there will be some fans who will go meltdown, because every club has fans that go into meltdown. That just happens. And we've got a lot of new fans who have joined over the last couple of seasons, which is great, because you want to expand as a club and reach a bigger audience. But in the bigger picture... You know, it, it's not that big a disaster if we have a, a bad start, and we've got a tough couple of fixtures. Because five years ago, this you know, this summer, five years ago, we nearly went out of business. Yeah. So the club has come a long way in five years, and the progress has been massive. And if things are a bit bumpy in this season to start with, he'll still get time. The chairman loves him. Steve <laughs> Parrish loves that 1990 team. He, he loved, that was his era, and he loves Alan Pardew. He's basically become best friends with Mark Bright now as well. Mark Bright seems to hang around with Steve Parrish all the time. So. So Pardew will get the backing of of, um, of Parish and the board, and, and and I think most of the fans. I think we know that he's the right fit for us at the moment. It would take something pretty disastrous, I think, for him to uh, to leave. And hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll hold on to a manager for longer than about you know a year. Last couple of years, every manager seems to stay with us for about you know fifteen months and then go. So hopefully, you know, that won't be the case. Yeah. Well, I, I'm. I'm interested to see what you do next season. You've brought in a couple of players. Uh, you've brought in Kabai and Bamford. I, I, as I mentioned in pre-record, I, I had a look through your season review show. You had a centre-back, credit midfielder, 25-goal season striker. You've probably got one of those things, <laughs> uh, I would say. You had Glenn Murray that got seven last season. And, uh, and obviously, Bamford had a good season last year. I think for him, at least, it's, it's probably the natural next move for him uh, to go on into a club like Palace. Are you, are you pleased with Bamford? Did you see much of him at Middlesbrough? I didn't see much of him. Uh, I've seen the highlight reels, as you all do when you <laughs> sign a new player. And I, I, I watched the playoff final. Unfortunately, his Borough uh. didn't do particularly well on that. But um, it, it's a tricky one getting going up from the championship. Some players really take it in their stride and score goals in the Prem. And some don't. You know, Glenn Murray um, went on loan last season to Reading in the championship. He came back from a long-term injury. Um, scored a few goals there. Came back for us uh, in the second half of the season and scored uh, quite a few goals. Scored all seven goals in the second half of the season. So, hmm. you know, he, he was proof that you can do it. That was after scoring 32 goals for us in the promotion season. And other players have done it. You know, Charlie Austin has done it. So it can be done, but it's, it's, it remains to be seen. And, and Bamford has actually never played a Premier League game. So, um, you know, he's got no experience of playing there. But we've got Kabai as you say and he's I mean that that whole thing is ridiculous the fact that we're even going after players like Kabai shows how much we've progressed and also shows how much money there is in the Premier League these days and the fact that Palace can even go after someone like that um so and we've got a centre back. We we don't have a centre back, but we have re-signed Breda Hangerland, which isn't the sexiest signing in the world. But he did okay for us last season as backup. <laughs> so we haven't got that new centre back yet, or the new striker. But but if we go into the start of the season with the team we've got already, I think we'll do okay. I suspect there might be a new striker coming in uh, with a slightly bigger profile than Bamford. But you know, if we start with what we've got right now, it's not a bad squad at all. Yeah, I, I think I think the Kabai transfer. You touched on it briefly. I think he is. It will obviously depend on his season, but I think on paper he looks like one of the best pickups for a club in the bottom. I don't want to say a bottom half team. I feel like you overachieved a little bit, and I think I think Roger might agree because it would be an Everton fan who finished in eleventh, and they might cost oh. themselves a little bit of a kind of 
sizable way above. But yeah. I think I think for uh, what we what we would probably suspect might be a bottom ten team this season, I think Kabai may well take you out of that mould and may, may, maybe you like be a, a proper mid table like a Stoke do currently. And if you can keep, I like, imagine that uh, calling Stoke like a like, a, like an above <laughs> top ten team, uh, incredible really. I think. I think Kabai is that sort of player that will take you to, to the next level. Uh, Roger, do you, have you got any thoughts on Palace from the outside looking in? Obviously, they finished a point above, well, not a point above, your place above you. How did that, how did that make you feel? Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> the whole season was a car crash. I'm not going to point fingers at Crystal Palace or Stoke or Southampton or ev- the other majority of teams that finished above us. But from, from what Jim was saying and from what you were saying about the season review show, uh, you wanted a, you wanted a centre back. Well, you actually signed. You've uh, got Scott Dan on a five year contract, which is I think is very good business because he was the player of the season uh, last year. He's very dependable, very rock solid. He was part of the the Birmingham team in a, I think it was t- 2009 2010, uh, which when I think they went about 12 games unbeaten. 12, 12 times the side didn't change, and him and Roger Johnson. Uh, with like the cornerstones of that side yeah. so I think you've done very well to actually keep him because I know Everton were actually interested in uh, Scott Dan and actually made uh, actually had a few meetings with Scott Dan um, goodbye I, I personally you said you wanted a centre back creative midfielder and a striker that's exactly what that is literally exactly what Everton want as well so and I would have loved goodbye in the in the number 10 role Pacey Wing is uh, on the wide flanks he can thread the balls through the full back through the centre back he can You've got Banford or uh, Glenn Murray making some clever runs. He can thread all these passes. I'm, I was really jealous. I'm not, I'm not, I, okay. You sound I just, jealous. I like it. <laughs> can I just jump in? I can't. I'm so embarrassed that I forgot about Scott Dan. Scott Dan. I can't believe I forgot about him signing a new deal. Um, how, why did I go to Britta Hangerland? That shows an insight <laughs> into my psyche that I don't think we want to explore. That I went straight to Hangerland and not Scott Dan. Um, you're absolutely right. Scott Dan was our Player of the Year and is a brilliant defender. Um, and there, you know, we we were worried that he might be going to Everton, yeah. and and on social media there seemed to be a lot of Everton fans who weren't that bothered about him signing. What did you think? Were you excited by him, or, or so a lot of them thought he wouldn't even get in the team? As um, well, we have in John Stones and Phil Jagielka, we have two very very good centre halves on both spectrums of the careers. John Stones is starting out; he's nailing down a regular Everton place. He is he is going to be one of the one of the best centre backs in world football in the next three or four years I'm absolutely sure Phil Jagielka tons of Premier League experience uh, England international played in the World Cup uh, he's he's been a very dependable and he's been a very good cent- Premier League standard centre back for a number of years now so I thought Scott Dan I don't he wouldn't have gotten the team straight away I don't think so because it's, you've got the captain and then you've got John Stones who's just oh, love him <laughs> uh, but Scott Dan would have been I think excellent comp- excellent backup and excellent competition when you think of the people we had mm. uh, competing for the for those spots last season still Van Distan who's about 804 <laughs> and Anton, Anton Alcaraz who's too busy I think he's too busy thinking about daffodils or something to realise this. I, 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 I forget I forget you've got Alcaraz at Everton well, that's, oh, that's we fun, don't anymore it? oh is no, he not there he's no longer oh. there he, no, we sent him out. Oh, released! I see on the list here. I've got. He's been released. Oh. Uh, how could you? How could you? <laughs> how, oh, very easily and very, <laughs> very happily at the same time. So, so Jim, looking at the team you're expecting to go into the new season with, um, th- does Kabai slot straight in there then? Well, this is this is the uh, subject of debate right now between Palace fans because midfield we're almost oversubscribed. I mean, it, it's easily our strongest strongest section because you've got Miller Jednak. You know, who tops the stats for tackles and blocks and stuff and you've got James MacArthur who was brilliant for us last season and ran uh, Scott Dan very close to player of the year you've got Joe Ledley who does a job we've even got players like Jordan Much who um, didn't really feature much last season but is uh, I think we signed him for like 4 million from QPR so we've got a lot of players and then of course Jason Punchin who mm. uh, you know was a match winner many times last season so actually it, it's going to be very interesting to see where Kabai fits in I personally think that depending on the opposition we play that will determine where Kabai plays. So against those uh, against those teams where it's a bit uh, dogged in midfield, I think we'll see him play a bit further forward. You know, you'll, you'll probably have a Ledley and, and Jednak in there to break things up. But against teams that might let us play a bit more, uh, weirdly, kind of the big teams, 
some of them come to Selhurst and let us play a bit more, I think you'll see Kabai play a bit deeper and you'll see punching in there sort of dictating things. But it's just, it's nice to have those options. Yeah, I was going to say, is, does it, is it unusual? Does it feel unusual? It feels unusual to have a high profile signing because usually Palace are the sort of team that makes fairly uninspiring signings in the transfer window. Uh, last summer, for example, we signed Kevin Doyle and Andy Johnson on deadline day. And neither of those signings got anyone uh, hot under the collar. And, and now, you know, a year later, we've got Johan Kabai. So that's the weirdest thing, really, getting around, getting around that. But I guess we are a club now that can compete in the transfer window. So, we, you know, we might be seeing more of these signings. Do you, do you think, obviously, we're pre-recording. Do you think by the end of the window, you'll bring in extra extra talent? I think there'll be another striker. I think there'll there'll definitely be another striker. Um, it, it, from, the, from the way the rumours are going, you know, we started off with Loic Remy and Charlie Austin. Now we're looking at some some guy from Borussia Dortmund who didn't play much last season. So you feel like they're getting knocked back by their uh, original targets. So I think we'll see someone, but I don't know if it's going to potentially be as high profile as Kabai. But to be honest, if we start the season with Glenn Murray, Bamford. Um, Dwight Gale, of course, who we've still got. He doesn't really get a mention, even though he's a very good striker. Yeah, Dwight Gale. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Snack against scoring about, against Liverpool, and that's that's about it. Um, we've still got Fraser Campbell, who you know is not the sexiest striker in the world, but he he does a job. And anyway, if we get one more, that's not a bad collection of strikers, is it? No, I, I don't mind it. Right then, uh, uh, before we move on to Everton, little prediction. Where do you think you'll finish? I think we'll finish eleventh. Or twelfth? No, eleventh. I think eleventh. Which, yeah, which no one upset with? Yeah, that's fine. All right. Okay then, uh, Rodri, Everton. All right. You had a. <laughs> you, you don't sound pleased. Uh, <laughs> you had. I would say you had an underwhelming season, and I'm gonna. I'm trying. I'm gonna try and be as neutral as possible as a Liverpool fan. I think you've had an underwhelming season. And my first question, really, what is? Was it hampered by Europa League football? Well, one of the one of the first things um, that Roberto Martinez said. Uh, when we actually fully qualified for the Europa League just as we were going into pre-season he said uh, we'll make sure Europa League doesn't affect us uh, he did um, he did quite a large interview with a bunch of Everton fan sites uh, about two months ago now and the first thing he said was wow well the Europa League I mean come on you can see the squad look at the, look, uh, look what happened there of course we can handle the Europa League so <sighs> it was, it was te- well the Europa League the campaign itself I think because it was a cup competition and people were going for the win more whereas in the Premier League sometimes you've got people playing for a draw you've mm. got different styles of football and also the other teams have in the Premier League they have experience of actually playing us so they've they probably found us out from the first season and so what they did they let us have the ball we'd make a mistake aka Gareth Barry would make a mistake oh. someone would take the <laughs> I'm kidding I quite like Gareth Barry <laughs> someone, someone would take the ball off uh, someone would take the ball they'd count it they'd have a chance they'd usually score um, Europa League was it was a great experience but to, it, there was there was a period when we almost got we were almost in real real trouble we were hovering around 15th 16th for for about a month and uh, if it wasn't for Aaron Lennon <laughs> I'll tell you what we could have been. Wow, really- what a I tell you what a sentence that is. That, that's <laughs> that if that ever summed up a season. My word, if it wasn't if it was for Aaron, Aaron Lennon. Lennon. Yeah. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> Sad thing is that's very that's it's very apt. We were oh, he he we came in and he actually showed the boys how to work hard. Even Leighton Bain said that he was like, Oh, Aaron Lennon had, um, Aaron Lennon embarrassed us into working harder. So, yeah. Said that in the echo. I just oh. I'm struggling to believe this. Uh, Aaron Lennon. Yeah, I mean, I've he never, was, he's never. He's he was, not been spoken this highly of since circa England, like two thousand and nine, when it was, was like the, the hot prospect. His end product. He well, he doesn't have one, but it's no. the it's the work it's the, it's the work ethic, and he just his pace makes things happen. He he got he he won us about three penalties, scored two goals, and I think he made two assists as well. And he just works so hard. He's oh, I want him back. We want it, We do want him back. Is it but, fair to say then that Aaron Lennon kept you up? Aaron Lennon is, um, <laughs> I believe he's on the Queen's Honours list for next year. Uh, the is rumour's it, going around right is, now. Is there any reason why you've not signed him? Because uh, apparently Spurs at the moment wants £9 million pounds for him. And because Ooh. he's in, yeah, exactly. Uh, he's in the last year of his deal. He wants the move to Everton. He's, he's, at the moment, he's actually training with the youth team at Tottenham because he's, he doesn't want to be there. They don't want him. He wants to move to Everton, only Everton. They they're not budging from nine million at that point at this point, 
Hopefully, is the uh, I think on deadline day we'll get him for about four million pounds. Everyone will be happy. He'll be playing. He'll be our knight in shining armor on the right wing with Coleman or, or whatever. And yeah, I think I'm confident he'll come back to Goodison Park. So aside from Lennon, who's st- you, you touched on John Stones earlier, who by the time this comes out may well have gone to Chelsea. Oh. Drink, you know, my wheel, I'm um, no. no, thank you. Who was who was your star man last season? Obviously, big money spent on Lukaku in the previous summer. Didn't quite do what everyone expected him to do. Um, but so, who who for you stood out? Can I can I uh, come back in about three days' time, please? Was there nobody that stood out? John, well, John Stones came back from injury about January time, and he he did well, but he didn't. He wasn't absolutely amazing. I mean, Phil Jagielka had a terrible start to the season. Around J- January again, he he picked up a bit. I don't think anyone stood out. I don't. I genuinely think there wasn't. There wasn't. No one had a very very good season. People. Some people had very good periods. No one had a very good season throughout. Mm. Like we'll come on to a club later that had a very similar situation. I look forward to talking about it. Um, but you spoke about Knight and Shining Armors earlier. Aaron Lennon being that. You've got another one. Tom Cleverley on a free. Oh. The I mean, that, the juices must be flowing around Goodison Park. T Clevs fifteen. Wow, <laughs> that's pre that's pre-ordered my away kit with that. Of course. Oh, I can't I, I can't wait to see it. I can't wait. To pick, <laughs> I'm, kidding, I'm kidding. There's no way I'm going. Get to it on get on your stuff. Instagram. Rival Jim. <laughs> I can't. I, look I can't to compete it. with that. You can't compete. What what numbers have I got? Uh, seven. Seven. Very oh, fancy. Yeah, yeah. Big, big time. Big time. Uh, so you brought in Cleverly and Delafeu. Yeah. Uh, which one excites you more? Because what was a free? Cleverly was a free, remember? Is LFA you've paid a little bit of money for? Um, for yeah, DLFA we paid about £4.3 million, which is, for a player of his ability, uh, he, hasn't got, he hasn't got the... His mentality needs to be sorted out a little bit. That's why uh, he fell out with the Sevilla manager uh, last season because mm. he, wasn't, he wasn't essentially a team player. But the ability he's got with the ball at his feet, is, it, it's quite, it would be quite frightening. He's a match winner. He, he can go missing in games. He can be quite anonymous. He can... He can sometimes he doesn't fancy it. He he won't play, but he's got the pace. He's got the he's just got that special something. He's got the got that little bit of magic. He can just he's a bit. I was going to say he's a bit. He's like Lionel Messi. In, he's like Lionel Messi. He's a bit like Lionel Messi in the sense that in such small spaces he can maneuver out of them and he can make space out of absolutely nothing and he can whip a ball in or he can have, he can have a shot. He's he's a kind of De La Feu is a kind of player that you actually go to pay. You want to pay money to go and see. Mm. Tom Cleverley, uh, he he came on a free. He's a, I think he's going to be a shrewd signing. He's been much maligned the last couple of years when he played for Man United and when he played for Aston Villa. But under Tim Sherwood, under a more attacking, uh, m- more just free flowing manager, he he played well. He got he he was on the left side of like an attacking three, and he scored about three or four goals uh, in about twelve games. And in the previous like a hundred and fifteen. He'd scored three goals for Manchester United and Aston Villa, so there's yeah. poten- there's potential there. I mean, Martinez has worked with him before at Wigan, and from the signs of preseason, we've only played like oh, we've played the likes of Hearts, Dundee, Swindon, Stoke, <clears throat> but he has looked he's looked very impressive, and he's got a good engine on him. And I think a three of him, McCarthy, and Barkley in the middle of the park, I think that could be very very useful for Everton in the in the future this season. Are you, are you expecting to set up in a similar way to, ironically enough, a similar way to Palace, playing three in the middle, playing two wide men, and then having obviously Lukaku up top? Is that what you're expecting to happen again this season? That I definitely think that'll be used. What we did, um, what we did against Hearts, we played Aruna Kone, <laughs> Ke- Kevin, Kevin Morales. <laughs> you and... sound very, you're very apathetic towards most <laughs> Everton players. <laughs> there's about, there's about, there's about three that I like. I oh, go on who. Let's do a top three. In no, in three, I'll do it. We'll do it like this. In three, Leighton Baines. Okay. In number two, oh god, uh, James McCarthy. At, you were struggling at two, <laughs> my god. And at the number and at the number one spot, John Stones. John Scott Stones. John. Tim, ha- Tim Howard cannot believe it. He cannot no. believe it. I don't care what Tim Howard. Ca- Tim Howard can't catch, and he can't believe it. I don't care. What Tim oh Howard. my word! Oh, can, I, can I also do my top three Everton players? Sure. So, oh, would you like me to do yeah, the count? Sorry, yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I didn't realize you wanted the same treatment. Yeah. In three, um, Seamus Coleman. Ooh. Good, I'll take that. Yeah, do you yeah. like Do you like Coleman? He's a good player, right? He had a yeah. I like. I do like Coleman. Like, but he had a very he had a very dodgy season last last year. He couldn't he wasn't the same going forward, and 
defensively, he, to be fair, he's he gets underrated. Defensively, he is defensively he is quite good. But going forward, is his like is his unique selling point as a as a fullback, and he just he was just non-existent as a force for most of the season. Yeah. Jim, ready? Yep. Two. <laughs> um, Leighton Baines. Leighton Baines, good. And at number one this week. Um, does, does Danny Cademartri still play for Everton? Well, I, mean, is that, <laughs> that was, I mean, he's no Aaron Lennon, but he was. No, he's, no. He, he, but he then was again, good. who is? Who is? Who is? <laughs> so Lukaku, I want to talk about him because you spent big money on Lukaku we did, um, uh, with with a ten goal league return, which, like you, again, apathetic. I imagine towards Lukaku season, uh, expecting much bigger things this season. Is, is it what happens if Lukaku doesn't have a good season this year? If Lukaku doesn't have a good season, then Everton don't have a good season. It really is as simple as that. He is our focal point. He, he, without him in the side, we struggle to get up the pitch because he, his his first touch has been much maligned. But he does he can hold the ball up and he can he does bring people into play. He is getting he is getting better at that. Um, when you take him out the out of the forward line, put a Rune Cody in, you're going to lose something. Of course you are. In total, in all competitions, I think he played around 50 games. Some off the bench, some start, most starting. He scored 20 goals and got eight assists. So it's not as bad as like it's not no. as bad as you, you'd think. But and also when you think about, um, he's only, he was only 21, so he's still learning. And we do, especially last season, Everton did not play to his strengths. Everton did not. Do clever little balls through the middle for him all the time. They didn't play quick passes that he could run onto and, and like battle defenders for. This season, I've seen it pre-season. There's a lot more of that. There's a lot. He's been allowed to peel off onto the wings. There's been Aruna Kone, Kevin Morales. They've been peeling off into the wings and they've been teeing him up. I think he scored. How many goals? I think he scored four goals in pre-season already, including a hat trick against Hearts. He got taken off against Dundee with a little hamstring injury so we hope that's going to be okay because if if it's not then we're in big trouble but it's a very big season for Romelu Lukaku and it's a very big season for Roberto Martinez as well I just like I'm not saying I'm, I'm going to go with my first Liverpool Everton dig if that's okay uh, oh, Liverpool, Liverpool have been off to you know Malaysia Australia you've been to Scotland and Singapore thank you oh Singapore. did you get to Singapore as well yes, yes we did what thank you. By, by accident or was that just was it a holiday or it was a, it was a, I think it was a Ryanair flight to, uh, <laughs> right oh imagine yeah, that imagine a Ryanair flight to Singapore <laughs> oh well, no, dear we, we were trying to get to Scotland but they somehow dropped us off in Singapore I believe oh well you know it's an easy mistake to make <laughs> um, so again prediction this season where do you see Martinez putting you um, are, are you expecting to finish above Palace this year yeah, without with no disrespect, but yes, I do. Without <laughs> without European distractions, I think we'll we'll show a truer form of what we are. And I think top seven. I think top seven for Everton this season. Are, is that you saying seventh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, now we come to the the Leicester segment of the show, uh, and as we're Palace, Everton, and Liverpool fans, we haven't got that. As I mentioned, if you're a Leicester fan and you want to come on in future weeks, please do. I think there's a few talking points that we can we can brush upon. I feel like we're football people, right? We can, yeah. we, can we can weigh in yeah. here, yeah. right? Yeah. So <laughs> I think we have to start with uh, with Pearson's exit being a little bit odd, being a little bit uh, just. I, I can't. It's strange, isn't it? It's not surprising, but it is strange because mm, you expect oh yeah. you expected something like this to happen. Maybe not quite what did happen, um, but Pearson's gone and Claudio Ren- Ranieri, the Tinker Man, is back. Yes, uh, Jim, I'm so happy about that. To be honest. I love Claudio Ranieri. Oh well, carry on. Mm. Tell me, tell me mm. more about your love for Claudio Ranieri. We've got time to fill it, so go ahead. I'd uh, well, my neighbor. Well, I used to have neighbors who were big Chelsea fans, and I'd watch a few of their games because at the time it was about two thousand and two, two thousand three. Yeah. Chelsea were like on the up. Everton were uh, well, uh, well, yeah. Chelsea played good football, and Everton didn't. I'll just put it like that. <laughs> okay. And um, I just like I like the way Claudio Ranieri played. I like the way he came across. I like his players liked him. He, I think I thought he played decent football. And yeah, no, I just I really like the guy. I just 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 a nice guy. Yeah, just a nice guy. I mean, like, we've not. We, have you met him? 
No. That's a, that's a theme so. Again, that, uh, well, in fairness, we probably wouldn't have said that about Nigel Pearson. <laughs> no, uh, at no point have I thought to myself, do you know what, lovely bloke. Yeah. <laughs> at no point. Misunderstood. And, Jim, they've made some decent signing. Christian Fuchs has come in from Schalke. Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> Rob, Robert Huth's come in from Stoke, who's very pleased with the move. Huth, Huth, I think the most per, the most pleased person with that move is Robert Huth, based on his Twitter account. And, uh, and Okazaki looks like he's going to be moving as well uh, from Mainz, the Japanese striker. Not bad, not bad strengthening there. I think Leicester fans should be pleased with all three. Do you know much about any of them? Well, obviously, how do you not know about Robert Hoof? I know more about Robert Hoof than I care to know about a man, um, <laughs> but I don't know too much about the others. But I, I, I would say they're probably not the sexiest signings, and I would, I would say Le- Leicester fans are probably at the moment more preoccupied with the new manager and mm. the fact that Pearson went because I, I know that I know a few Leicester fans and they really wanted him to stay just despite everything despite you know throttling opposition players on the touchline um, and the <laughs> oh, fact that he, what's he, a lovely he, sentence that is despite <laughs> throttling opposition players we still want him here he's still our guy but they did because he kept them up he did He did an, you know not the nicest guy in the world but did an incredible job in keeping them up did, did very well so I think um Ranieri is a very nice guy and for some reason that that's important to me I don't know why but for some reason I like players more based on the fact like I love Juan Mata I, I think he's oh. a good player but he's just one of the nicest guys that's ever yeah, lived on the planet lovely and chap I, yeah. I love him John good Terry to name, to name another not, not a fan not a fan <laughs> of John Terry uh, uh, go on but um, I think I think Ranieri's got got a lot to prove he, his record he doesn't have a brilliant record when it comes to to actually winning stuff like yes he's been managed at some big clubs but he hasn't actually won anything I think since he was at Valencia which would have been what 2000 or something yeah. so he doesn't really have a massive track record yes he's a nice guy and I don't think he's a bad manager but I think it's a bit of an odd it's an odd yeah, one really you, you, Pearson was good he could galvanise them and, and, and really you probably wanted someone who had a bit more experience with keeping a team in the Premier League rather than trying to win the Premier League I know they wanted Martin O'Neill I think didn't they and, and, yeah. and that would have been perfect that didn't work out so I, 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 would, I would possibly say Leicester probably going to be around the bottom three again this season I think well last season 14th was as you've seen Pearson did a, Pearson did a great job 14th is, is more than any Leicester fan probably could have dreamed of um, they haven't got Cambiasso he won't be coming back um, which makes me sad because I liked seeing him. Mm. I, I like seeing. I, I'm. I'll be surprised if he doesn't just end up in the MLS like everyone else. Um, yeah, he has gone there now. Has he actually officially gone to the MLS? Pretty sure. I can, I'll, I'll have a quick check. I can't remember which one, but I'm pretty sure he's in the MLS now. I feel like I feel like I am the only person that hasn't moved to the MLS. Yeah. <laughs> it feels like everyone else has. I feel like when when is it going to be my turn? When am I going to play for <laughs> Toronto Blue Jays or whatever they're called? Yeah. I think you. I think you've got to be about 38. Well, I'm 31, so I'm not far. I'm not far off. <laughs> yeah, have a couple of years in the championship and then make you move. That's what <laughs> yeah, I say. Yeah. Nice. Um, but no, I, th- I think Cambiasso will be a miss. I think I, I honestly fear a little bit for Leicester. I'm not sure they'll go down, but it just strikes me as the sort of thing. Whereas if if Ranieri doesn't have a good start, that he'll be the first target of the fans' sort of criticism. Uh, it, I don't, I don't know why. I think if there's a first manager to go this season, I feel like. It could be Ranieri, and, and obviously I, d- I don't wish any manager to be sacked. I just think it's a, and I'm, I'm I support a club with Brendan Rodgers in charge, but I, but I think I think Ranieri is at the most risky club this season yeah. based on how how it's like what's gone on before with how sort of uh, although Pearson was, was quite evidently a horrible bloke, he was very stable um, in a strange sort of cross way. Um, so yeah, I think I think they could be in danger. You you were asking me earlier about. Uh, why is Pardew right for Palace? And we were saying Pardew is the right fit for Palace. Yeah, it, it doesn't feel like Ranieri is the right that's fit for exactly Leicester. Right that's now. exactly it. That's exactly. It. So where do you see Leicester next season? You've already said around the bottom three. If you could put a number on it, uh, I'm going to say what's third bottom? 18th. I'm going to say 18th. All down, Rodri. Yeah, I think I think 16th. I, I think they'll be just I'll just about okay again. To be quite honest, but with Pearson, he he did throttle people. His son was a bit <laughs> mad. He called. <laughs> thousands of people ostriches and (laughs) castadized the whole wildlife community but his only goal was to keep Leicester City up and he did that so he should have in my opinion he should have stayed I don't know what happened behind the scenes there's too much that happened in front of the scenes but behind the scenes I don't know what happened for that to just for it to boil over and say you know what this is it yeah well okay yeah I I think 16th 17th is about right I think they'll stay up I think it'll be close though I think think it They've got too much quality to go down now. Yeah, really do yeah, but we said that about people said that about Hull City last season. 
Yeah, they had some true. very good. They spent a lot of money. Had some very good players, and they struggled again because it just something didn't quite feel right behind the scenes. And I just feel like it's the same thing with Leicester. Yeah, um, could score goals. Well, yeah, that as well. <laughs> that's, that's quite that's, crucial. Yeah, if you don't, if you can't score goals, then you're not going to be very good at football. That's my uh, that's my that's detailed true. view. <laughs> I'm discussing with, with a team that had a top goal score of 10 and 7, so I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, <laughs> anyway, I can't put this off any longer. Because uh, Steven Gerrard was Liverpool's top goal scorer last season with 9, so I mean, I'm mean, i in good company. Uh, we'll, we'll move on to, to my boys then. It was... I mean, do you want to ask me a question? And I'll answer it. I, I'm, I'm turning it around a little bit. I got, I got one, I got one. Sure. How, how much do you miss Stevie G already? Mm. I think... I, in a way, I'm pleased that he's. He looks to me like he's enjoying LA, and if you're in LA, you should enjoy it. And I, I think as a Liverpool, from, from my perspective, I'm pleased he's gone in a way because I thought another season would just do more damage. Not not necessarily yeah. to to him as as um, as a man because I think obviously around Liverpool and around the world he's loved by Liverpool fans. But for the team, I think it's the best thing that could have happened to him, and it's it's the right time to happen. Of course, I think everyone's gutted he's not finished his career at Liverpool because it just seemed like it should happen. Um, and it hasn't happened, but overall, I, I, I think it's I think it's a smart move by club and the player to, to move him on now. Um, and the same goes for Glenn Johnson; he's going to be universally missed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Brad Jones, another one. I'm disappointed mm. that they won't be. Yeah, there will be just... statues at Anfield at some point, surely. I'm think yeah, in the same way that Manchester United have got uh, is it Dennis Law, Bobby Charlton, and <laughs> and one other. Oh, yeah. I feel like one day we might see the Gerard Johnson Jones. <laughs> Ryan Babble, Ryan Babble, he'll, he'll be there as well. Outside the new main stand, I'm thinking, yeah, get those three there. <laughs> we'll, we'll meet you at the uh, the J, the JGG or whatever it would be stadium. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I think those three will probably, in a weird way, losing those three players will probably make us a better side. Yeah. Um, mm. And some of the signs we've made, I'm, I'm very. I'll go through the signings actually because I think Liverpool, much like every season. Uh, are based preseason on what they what, what they do in the transfer market. It always seems to be something. Uh, Milner, I think, is a really good signing. I, I don't think there's any issue with that at all. Um, yeah, very very pleased. He's going straight into my fantasy team. That's oh. that's brave. That's yeah, very that's brave. Think, really? I yeah. Think he'll, get, he'll get points. We'll get. Well, maybe. He, I don't know. I feel like he'll. I think he's going to flourish in Liverpool. I think he's going to he's going to sort of progress from that bustling midfielder into actually someone that gets assists and goals. I just. I think it's the right fit for him. I put he's, I put Henderson over Milner based on the fact he'll probably take all the set pieces. Well, that's a, that's a fair point. I did have Henderson last season actually, and he did he did very well for me. So. Yeah. Nice nice hair as well. So. Very nice hair, and he's on the the front of FIFA 16, which I feel is like a trophy. I, Arsenal have got their Emirates Cup. We've got the front cover of FIFA uh, 16. <laughs> I, I think that's a fair trade. Uh, Danny Ings. I think I was very hesitant pre-signing Danny Ings because, and and almost for the career of Danny Ings, I'm worried that he'll just just disappear within a year, and it, and he'll go out on loan to to someone, and no disrespect to someone like Palace, the next year, and he'll do great for you. And, that, and that's, oh, I'd had Danny Ings, I'd had Danny Ings in a heartbeat. That's the, and I just feel like that sort of thing is bound to happen with Danny Ings. You you bring Danny Ings in, and then afterwards you bring Benteke in, and you hope Sturridge comes back, and it's just all of a sudden you think. What's Danny Ings really doing here? Yeah. Um, and, and, I, and he's going to have a similar season to Barini. I hope that's not true. I hope he plays. We've got a lot of games this season, so I'm sure he'll get his, his chance. Adam Bogdan, great, yeah. Um, <laughs> Joe, Joe Gomez, who, who arguably in, in, in early pre season looked like our best player. Um, extremely impressive. Hardly seen anything of him before, um, but slotted in at right back and left back. Looks, looks fantastic. In, in fact, probably looked better than Klein. Uh, in early whoa, preseason, whoa, whoa. honestly, I know. No, just just with I love Klein. Pre- preseason, he he looked he looked a more complete player than Nathaniel Klein. I think Klein took a little bit of getting used to who he was playing with. Anyone who's who stood next to Martin Skirtle will struggle. So <laughs> I just want to clear that out. But we'll look great. You'll look great. Oh, you'll look you'll look yeah, plenty of covering. Uh, you'll look great. Uh, Firmino, I think, is a, a terrific signing. I think him and Coutinho could become magical, uh, as, as we all hope. So Klein again, I think, is a signing that should have happened last year. Um, but I'm pleased he's in that he's come in. I, I, I can't. We've, I think we've made more transfers than you two put together. Yeah, you've oh, made yeah. a lot. Uh, yeah, we <laughs> we just spend loads of money. Klein is brilliant as as a as a Palace fan. Well, yeah. Tell me about what how your experience is with Daniel Klein. He, he's arguably, and this might be bold, the best fullback we've ever had, and that is very bold for a player that that came through our academy and and only and played a couple of seasons basically. But he 
you could see straight away he was destined for the top and he was destined to leave us, basically. And he, he stayed much longer than he was due. He could have gone to Wolves in 2010. He could have gone to Man United in 2012 uh, or 2011. He hung around and, um, as a result, earned us uh, a decent sell-on fee. Actually. I think we got a, a bit of a, a wedge from from Southampton uh, going to Liverpool. So um, yeah. he's absolute class. Though. He's brilliant on the ball. He works very hard. He can get forward. He's just... He's got everything about him that just just looks like I think I think it'll be England's right back for for years to come. Uh, yeah, I, I've spoken about this. I, I stream a lot. Just just to clarify to to the pair of you who might not know, I stream on Twitch a lot, um, and and get asked Liverpool questions a lot. And I and I've expressed my dis- displeasure at the fact that because he's now signed for Liverpool, he will be guaranteed to start right back for England for the next four or five years. But he should anyway. He, he should, should have been at somewhere else. Exactly. Really. He sh- he should anyway. But this sort of big club thing that happens within England that we don't like to talk about but definitely exists oh yeah definitely well I mean I I don't think I'm being biased or unfair when I say that I think I think Scott Dan and Jason Punchin if if Ings and um, Vardy were in England I think Dan and Punchin should have at least been given a go because they were superb for us tail ender last season absolutely brilliant and we we had like a top six form I think yeah. last few games so anyway I've got a slight story about Joe Gomez actually weirdly oh, my, one of my mates at Palace who I do the podcast with his son used to play for the um, Palace Academy and I think uh, maybe the Charlton one but he knew Joe Gomez because I think Gomez was at the Charlton Academy possibly at Palace I'm not sure you know kids move around when they're, yeah. when they're young and um, he was mates with him and um, they sort of grew up together same sort of age and he says that Gomez was even from 15, 14, 15 never went out trained every day incredibly professional very nice young man but one of these kids that very much had his heart set on being a footballer and it sounds just like he's very grounded very professional and hard working which you know you don't hear that a lot about yeah. footballers these days H- hearing that that makes sense with how he conducts himself on the pitch as well just from seeing it and again you, you take preseason with a pinch of salt but just watching him he didn't look out of his depth at all he looked like he knew exactly what he was doing he, he looked like and from what you've just said he looks like the perfect player to manage yeah. because he's he's listening he wants to learn and uh, and yeah I think I think I think this season it'll, it'll feature a little bit but I don't think he'll be he'll be a mainstay um but no I, I like him a lot and by the time this comes out we might have signed the PSG left back uh, Lucas Digne. Digne yeah so that'll be interesting too and obviously I can't not continue without talking about Benteke for mm. quite a fee it's rumored to be split it's rumored to be like a 16 and then 16 over 4 years which I'm pretty pleased with if I was a Villa fan I'd be livid frankly i think they've been screwed again out of that sort of deal um but i, I think a lot of people will say i will we'll talk about last season actually we'll, we'll go back in time a little bit last season was was in three parts we started the season dreadfully um it, it wasn't great it looked extremely disorganized uh then we switched to a three at the back with two wing backs and we had a 13 match on beaten spell uh which everyone raved about and then the end of the season came round. we all realized we weren't getting in the champions league we all sort of didn't want to be in the europa league and everyone stopped caring and that was most evident on the final day against Stoke, where we we start our campaign. Yeah. Um, and I, and the the question I get thrown at me when when Ben Seke is mentioned is he doesn't fit Liverpool style. If you think Liverpool had a style last season, <laughs> you didn't watch Liverpool last season. I'm telling you, there wasn't a style. Oh yeah, but they're a passing side. Well, not accurately. <laughs> I mean, last season it wasn't it wasn't great. I think Ben Seke is is arguably exactly what we need. He's someone who's going to be there. If, without injury obviously week in week out he's going he's gonna to be our figurehead he's going to be everything we work around and I think he's a far better player than the, the battering ram that Villa have had oh, he's and, a very good player he's very good with the ball at his feet he's very underrated in that regard yeah I, th- I think stats show that he's not particularly but I think if you play up front for Villa a team that aren't always controlling the game he's not going to be getting it into feet he's not going to be able to pass it off he's not going to be be working moves with everyone else around him he's going to be that sort of target man get as a goal kind of guy and, yeah. and, at, and at Liverpool if you're a centre forward you need to do a bit more than that look at Suarez look at Sturridge etc etc look at Ricky Lambert uh, you need to do a little bit more and yeah I think I think he's good I think I think he's what we need it'll come to fruition soon to find out if that actually is the case and that now brings me on boys to uh Raheem Sterling because I feel like I can't not talk about it at all uh, 49 yeah. million pounds did you I've, I did a show all about Sterling because I thought it was worthy um, and, and the way English players are treated in general but mainly on Sterling what would you have bought him for if you like if well, okay no no what would you have bought him for what did you value him at and he obviously went for 49 straight which I'm a fan of <sighs> I, I, I would have said honestly right now in his career I would have said half that half yeah. 49 25 maybe because and I appreciate City are 
by they're paying for the future. They're not paying for Sterling now. They're paying if they keep him. They're paying for the Sterling that will develop in the next few years. And he, you know, he's got massive potential. The guy could be incredible, mm. but it just it just irks to see teams spending that much money. It's just it's just so much. It's just so much money. Um, and, and unfortunately, it is the case with English players getting inflated uh, in the market right now. Um, and if that's, you know, I've got a mate who's a lawyer who's always saying, well, the market dictates. And if that's what it is in the market, fine, it's 49 million. But mm. f- for me, I think it's, it's a lot and it puts a lot of pressure on him. But he seems like a bullish young kid who sort of takes it in his stride. So, and he's done all right in their preseason friendly so far. Yeah, I, I, think he's, I think he's a fantastic player. I think 49 million is ridiculous it's too much but as, yeah. as a Liverpool fan I and I'm going to use an expletive for folks I couldn't give a shit frankly <laughs> um, because I know QPR get get a portion but yeah. but to get so we he's a he's very and uh, he's young and he's allowed to be frankly but he's very inconsistent and um, if he finds a level of consistency with City he's going to be a fantastic signing and in three or four years he'll be worth that 49 million yeah. that, that City paid and in the current climate that could be what 80 million to, to a Barca or Real if he plays well yeah. um, but obviously if it doesn't work out they've spent 50 million on a glorified Jordan Ibe so you know I like Ibe I like Jordan Ibe he's, um, like, yeah, another, he's another man with a good pre-season under his belt yeah. one of one of my uh, one of my friends used to play with Jordan Ibe at Wickham Wanderers and he was when he was 14 they played Chelsea in a pre-season friendly and uh, he tore he tore up Ashley Cole he, he, wow he, he did a madness on Ashley Cole and when he was when he was 15 this is around when Fulham were um, were getting to the Europa League final getting beaten by Atletico Madrid uh, an extra time only five years ago absolutely yeah. ridiculous but anyway he completely <laughs> rejected Fulham they were willing to pay 1.5 million pounds for him they completely wow. rejected him wow. at 14 he obviously, he obviously saw himself out of, out of Liverpool then, which is yeah. He was wait, he was literally waiting for a bigger club at fourteen years old. Imagine, hope, having, imagine having that confidence. Yeah, ho- hopefully he doesn't do that in four years. <laughs> 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 that would be that would be because I've seen that happen. So uh, let's say that doesn't happen again. I I think we'll have a decent season. I think a lot of obviously you've spoken about Brendan Rodgers and if Klopp would come in and if and uh, to be honest, I never thought Klopp as much as I would like Jurgen Klopp to have come to Liverpool. It seemed quite obvious quite early after we started s- signing players. That, that Rogers was going to be our man as soon as like the Danny Ings thing was mentioned as soon as Milner was coming in it was like okay let's let's stop this now because he's clearly got a plan and FSG are letting him execute it um, I, I don't think he's under as much risk early in the season as the media seem to think he might be or, or rival fans think he might be I think he's going to get time I think you need to give him another year I think if you, if you mm. put him on this sort of contract then you've got to give him one more year see what he gets on if it doesn't work then We'll have to see from a, from an outsider point of view. How do you see the the Rogers situation? Do you think do you do you see him like do you see his position under threat immediately if he doesn't start well, or do you think we'll give him time? I think um, there's always that saying that a, peop- uh, a manager who's making a lot of signings can't train the players he's already got. So I don't I don't think the players have an awful lot of confidence in him. Mm. I don't don't think I don't think he's going to be if like Liverpool have got a very I've got a tough start, especially with the away games. Yeah. So I think the, the, there'll be a level of understanding if they aren't, if they're maybe sitting around eighth or ninth come October, November. But around, I think maybe Christmas time, if you're not within at least touching distance of the top four, he'd be. I think he'd be very, very under threat, especially with the transfer window coming up. Yeah, I think I think the fact that Klopp is still out of work, yeah, may pay Klopp- something towards it as well. Klopp and Liverpool would be a perfect fit, unfortunately. Just yeah. because he's he's a footballing man, and he's also a very emotional man. And then you've got the cop, and you've got you've got all the rest of it to go with it. Yeah. I think it would just, I think they would fit perfectly, and that's why I was very happy that he didn't go. I I, I did say that if Liverpool were going to replace Rodgers, there was only one man I would like to see replace Rodgers, and it would be Klopp. I wouldn't want to see as much as I rate. I know this is this maybe speaking completely out of turn because a manager like Ancelotti might not come to Liverpool but I don't necessarily think Ancelotti actually maybe Ancelotti's one that might fit but there are certain sort of top tier managers that would come in for example I wouldn't have liked to see seen Gabriel and Capello do you know what I mean I know he's, oh, he's had, I know he's had a rough time but his standing of football is that large that FSG might look at that and go let's get a man like Capello in <sighs> Obviously, it's it wasn't even spoken about. But do you, yeah. do you know what I mean? That that sort of caliber yeah, of manager sort of like, yeah, that, that wouldn't have really big name. But, Almost, it would be yeah. more of a dictatorship under a man like Capello. There's a few managers out there similar. He he was just my example based on the fact we've seen him in action uh, in England. He but, was he was so bad as Russia coach that um, 
he's gone now, but he was so bad as Russia coach that Russia fans were actually pulling money together to try and pay him pay him his compensation fee to just leave. <laughs> If there's one country I'd expect to have enough, <laughs> it would be it would be Russia. Um, but I think in terms of where we'll finish this season, I think I think fifth is yeah. is really likely. I'm going to obviously talk to fans of the top the top four. I did two yesterday. I think I think the top four from this season will be the top four of next season. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, it's sewn up. It's sewn up. And it's it and it's not me being a negative Liverpool fan. I think fifth is extraordinarily likely. Um, I think our squad is far better than it was last season. I think we look far more ready for this season than we did last season. Um, and again, I'll probably get a few Tottenham fans. We'll talk to a Tottenham fan later in the week um, who think that they are again a clear favourite for fifth or maybe maybe even fourth. I don't know. I don't, I'll have to find out later in the week. But I think fifth for Liverpool looks pretty likely. Wouldn't be dreadful. I think it might not be enough for Rodgers to keep his job. Um, yeah. But I think it's. I think it's. I think your se- your season rests on keeping Sturridge fit. I think and if he's fit for the whole season, then then you could be uh, pretty decent going yeah. forward. I think he comes back towards the end of September, early October. Yeah, so you need him. You see. need him fit, really. Yeah, Stur- Sturridge and Benteke, because let's not forget Benteke did do his uh, anterior cruciate ligament not yeah. so long ago. Yeah, I think what we've decided if we get half a season out of both of them, <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be all right. You know, where's, where's the problem? Um, <laughs> But no, again, I think fifth. Are you boys the same sixth, fifth kind of area? Yeah, I think maybe, yeah, maybe a cup, maybe a cup run for you guys. I think you're right. If you finish fifth, Rogers might might not, you know, might not stay. But if you win a cup, maybe I don't know. It's it's it is difficult, isn't it, to break into that top four because it is just like you say, it is almost sewn up already. Yeah. Yeah. The only the only person the only person the only team I can see maybe dropping out of the top four is Manchester United, and I know they are they've spent big. They're probably going to spend a little bit more, but they they spent big last season. They didn't. They they did uh, get the Champions League. They weren't amazing, which is is a sign of a good team. Mm-hmm. But yeah. with, the, with the Champions League as well, and maybe if like they fall out of um, the Champions League, the Europa League, with all those European distractions, and there will be pressure on Van Gaal to get a cup. So he he might have to go for like the FA Cup, probably not the Capital One Cup, but maybe the FA Cup. I think they they're the only team in that was in the top four last season that could drop out this season but I think I still... they've, they've made some they've made some very smart signings I think the, the signings this season are way smarter for, for Premier League football than, yeah. than there they were, they were big gambles last year Di Maria and Falcao were huge gambles I think people like Schneiderlin are going to do, oh, do very well Schneiderlin would be perfect for them yeah. Schweinsteiger world class of course you can't you can't knock him for that it's, but cu- it's, it's just... curious though isn't it the, sh- yeah, the, the Schweinsteiger it signing it's, he's he's Someone said, I can't remember what podcast I was listening to a few weeks ago, but this, um, they said Man United need a bastard in the middle of the park. <laughs> and Bashing Schweinsteiger is a bastard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's, got, he's almost got it in his first name. They've, so. they've, had a, <laughs> they've had a few in the past as well, and he certainly, he certainly ranks up there. Uh, I, it's funny you say that you, you think they could drop out. I think they'll be Chelsea's closest challengers if City don't buy a pro- another proper defender. I think Arsenal are going to challenge. Well, there I we are then. Arsenal, yeah. Arsenal, I really think Arsenal have got it. Time will yeah. tell. Time will tell. Uh, I think that brings us to the end, gentlemen. It has been an absolute pleasure having you both on. Uh, of course, we can find you both on all sorts of social media. Uh, Roger, where can we find you if we'd like to find you? Uh, mainly Twitter, really, at our Canon W Journal. Lovely. Uh, and Jim? Uh, on Twitter at Jim Daily Comedy and you know Instagram if if, if you yes want of course the food, it's also Jim Daily Comedy there'll be links to both of them uh, in the <laughs> description of course and I'll put Jim's Instagram in there because it's worth checking out uh, <laughs> boys it's been a pleasure talking to you both I uh, appreciate thank you coming you. on thank you very much uh, hopefully we'll see you again this season if you fancy coming definitely back. yeah definitely, oh, definitely yeah. Right, brilliant uh, so for, for this week's or for today's football chat with Ben that brings us to the end there'll be another one tomorrow and there was one yesterday so uh, so check both of them out and I'll see you again soon from me Dr Benji until next time goodbye. <laughs>